a lot of extra things. First of all, uh, looking at the weather, I kind of think it's safe to say that we won't be doing anything this evening. Okay? So once we're done and you go home, we're done. All right? So that's the first thing. So no announcements about that besides that. Okay? Second of all, the bulletin says Wednesday prayer service is at the barracks again. It's not. She's having surgery on Tuesday. Um, I think uh, Terry accidentally left that in there. We do have a board meeting tomorrow night here at the church in the back room. And uh, so keep that in mind. Roller skating is coming up in a few weeks. You look at that. And you know some of the other things there as well. I think that's enough on the announcement side. Um, have a lot of people that have had surgeries, a lot of people that are heading for surgery, <clears throat> dealing with uh, sicknesses and other things. So remember to pray for our folks. Um, you all pray for uh, uh, Leo, Ryan, he had a stroke, um, a mini stroke, and, and had some paralysis, so pray for him. Um, need to pray for uh, the Shirley Barrett that's heading for surgery on Tuesday, um, for uh, John Chippy who's heading for surgery on uh, the 10th. Um, you know, there's a, a couple of uh, folks like that. And uh, again, I didn't get to talk directly to Marlene to confirm with her. Uh, but she called yesterday and told me that um, she got some bad news from the doctor and wants us to pray about it and uh, that, that they're debating on uh, possible chemo and stuff. So pray for Marlene as well. Okay. Um, keep that in, in mind. And Joe Shaw, we mentioned him, a couple other folks. So we'll remember to pray about them. I'm sorry I'm going so fast. Hope you'll pick it up. Because we're going to move quick today, all right? Uh, then Mr. Johnny uh, brought out uh, some pictures here of um, uh, back when they were doing some things on the parsonage that he thought you'd like to look through. And so uh, here's a picture for you to pass around. See if you can spot the the uh, the the 125 year old Thelma there back when she was young. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that's it on those announcements. All right. So let's uh, go ahead and sing number 397, Higher Ground. Higher Ground, 397, standing together and singing.
take up our offering. We'll ask Mike if he'd take us before the throne. And, uh, pray over our day. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your house to be here. We can come and worship you freely. Lord, we just pray that you be with us, dwell with us in this next time as we look into your word, change our minds and hearts to better serve you. Lord, we pray for those that could not be with us. I pray, Lord, that they are spending time in their lives with you. Lord, we just thank you for all those that do that. And Lord, just pray that uh, we have a good, good day, have safe travels. Lord, pray that you take this offering, that you multiply it and spread your word. All these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
absolutely wonderful, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. Bonnie said you remind her of James. <laughs> Romans chapter 12. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Back to your bulletin is the entire message. You'll get the rest of that next week. Today I'm just going to do the introduction to that message. I'm going to bring you into the first five verses. We'll do 6 through 21 next week. All right? Instead of doing the whole chapter today, we're going to cut it down a little bit for you. Famous verse starts out with, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. How many of you have ever heard a message on that verse? All of us, right? Okay, this is a very famous verse. One of the things that, that we, we do, there's nothing wrong with preaching about this verse and the idea of being uh, willing to sacrifice and, and you know, being a sacrifice for the Lord. But one of the things we do when, when we don't preach things in total context is maybe we lose a little bit of what, what is the, the underlying meaning doesn't mean we've changed it or ruined it. doesn't mean any of that. But today, I want to start out this chapter with that little thought. That God is having you here sought uh, to, to by, by the mercies God gives you, to present to God you as a living sacrifice. That's what God wants. He wants you, by the mercies God gives you, to present you as a living sacrifice. But I want to ask you to think about something with me. Not only is it your reasonable service, but my question would be, what? What is your reasonable service? Being a living sacrifice? What is that? What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Does it mean that every one of us gets out of the, the work we're in, the ministry or job we're in, and we all go into full-time witnessing, full-time preaching, full-time proclaiming. Is that what it means? No. Does it mean that, that we never do anything that's fun or encouraging in the sense of uh, you know, parties or, or Christmas presents or, or ball games because they're, they're useless things that won't matter in eternity. Is that what it means? No. Well, what does it mean to present our bodies a living sacrifice? And I think as we read the context here, we, we start to see. Verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world. So one of the hints that tells you how you live as a living sacrifice, a reasonable service, is to uh, not allow your body to be conformed to the world. Now, what does it mean to conform to something? Well, have you ever done uh, a, a mold? My mother, when we were in the campground, she used to make ceramics, and then we had a kiln that we would take the ceramics and, and heat them and make it into where it was something people could paint, or after they painted it, you would do it to make the paint do a certain thing. It's pretty neat. Um, but when you make uh, something, you, you have a mold, and you pour in the stuff you want to make it out of, and what's it do? It conforms to every nook and cranny of the mold. It fits it. The Bible does not want us to mold ourselves or conform ourselves or make it to where we are fitting to every nook and cranny of the world. Sometimes it's awful hard to decide how do you separate daily living and the world and living for Christ. How do you separate that so you can understand what is normal, acceptable behavior and what is not? And I think that's the idea of if you approach God the way uh, Paul does, I die daily or Every day I wake up with the attitude that I am dead to myself and I'm alive in Christ, you will make different decisions. 
But as we're making a living sacrifice, we, we are saying to ourselves, part one, I don't want to be conformed to the world, I want to be conformed to God. Which means I'm not going to conform to my own wishes, my own desires, my own wants, my own thoughts. I'm not going to do that. I'm instead going to conform to what God says. It's not easy to do. And that's why it's called a living sacrifice. Okay? But it goes on and says in the next part, but be transformed. Not just don't be conformed, but be transformed now by the renewing of your mind. To transform something, uh, many of you have seen those little toys, right? The Transformers. They're a car and then you do all kinds of stuff to them and they're supposed to come out and be something else. Um, uh, Alexander's had a couple of those toys and, and they're, they're a lot of fun to play with, but they're awful hard to get into one position and then once you get them there, they're awful hard to figure out how to get them back to the other one with, without breaking them. They don't transform so well, right? Well, listen, God wants us here to, to see we're not to be conformed to the world, fitting to their mold. We're to be transformed into something different than what the world is. So it's not just that we're not fitting to the world, but it's also the idea of that we're transformed into something totally different. Different than what we originally appear to be. We appear to be a part of this world and participant in this world. But God says, be a living sacrifice so that when people see you, what do they see? Do they see the person that you were or the transformed person? Which do they see? Do they see someone that's conformed to them and fitting and, and like them? Or do they see someone that's totally different from them? Transformed into something totally different. And how do we do this transforming? By the renewing of our mind. How do you renew your mind? You get into this book. Because what happens in us is we get into a groove and a rut and we assume everything is going great and look at me and I'm growing spiritually and we're going to church faithfully and I'm involved in all these ministries and, and we get all excited about all those things but that's not transformation. That could be a version of conformity. Could be. It might be a part of what God is doing in you, but it could be a part of conformity. So to be transformed, I need to renew my mind constantly, as Paul said, die daily. Constantly be seeking God's input into everything we're doing here in prayer and allowing Him to change my mind. You know, we Christians, we're a stubborn people. Very stubborn. And we're stubborn on bad things. Sometimes we're stubborn on good things. Listen, God wants us to be not conformed to the world, transformed by renewing the mind. Okay, it goes on and tells us that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the end result of not being conformed but being transformed? That you prove to others what is good, acceptable, and perfect in the will of God. Good, acceptable, and perfect in the will of God. Now, listen, folks. That means that when I do what God asks me to do, when I transform by the renewing of my mind or allowing His Spirit to change me, and I stop conforming to the world, that I am an example to others of what is good, acceptable for God. You and I need to, to understand the importance of this. Because I think that we're often frequently very willing to, to be similar to the world. All of us. When maybe that's not so important. God doesn't want me conformed. He wants me transformed. 
And the end result is I prove to the world what God really wants out of Christians. Would you agree with me? I'm not trying to judge other people, but just looking at a whole. Would you agree with me that Christians around the world, particularly here in the United States, do not have the reputation befitting of servants of the King? As a whole. I know there are some individuals we could look at and say they're doing a good job. But as a whole, Christianity, Christians do not have the reputation of being approving of who Jesus is and what is good and acceptable and perfect before Him. Would you agree with me? That's where we are. Why is that? I'll tell you why. And you'll find this in the rest of the chapter because we spend our days living for ourselves, which is conforming to the world. God wants me to be transformed, to not be happy with what I am, to constantly work towards renewing and fixing and making better and stronger. The end result is I prove to others what God really wants. So people say about us Christians, we're a bunch of hypocrites, but I'd like just once for them to be able to look at one of us and say, that one's not. Right? That's our goal. That one's not. There is a genuine Christian. What a testimony that is. I have a few friends that I've heard that about. The fellow that's now the, um, the chaplain in the jail. Bob Kimmel. What a great man. Everyone I've ever met about him would talk about how, how blessed we are to be his friend and what, what a true honor it is to meet a man that loves the Lord like that. The Bible goes on and says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you. So, uh, uh, words that are telling us that he's saying by what God gives him to everyone that's listening, not to think of himself more highly than he ought. Do you understand that we're building towards the rest of the chapter? We always read verse 1 and 2, and we always preach on verse 1 and 2, but we're not seeing what the rest of the chapter is about. And what's the rest of the chapter about? Well, it starts to tell us. For I say through the grace, given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought. You see, one of the things we do as Christians is we believe we have the answers and we know how to do it and the other people are dumb. Stupid, stupid, stupid. They're stupid, not smart. Right? Hey, what do we end up doing to ourselves when that's what we do? Goes on and says, but to think soberly. That, that means clearly, honestly, with nothing affecting your thought processes. One of the problems we have as Christians is we get our little pet peeves and they stick in us and that's the only thing we can do. You know, so somebody might love the family so much that that's all they can see. Somebody else might like hard work so much that's all they can do. And they don't see how the hard work that they do with the wrong attitude in the wrong way messes up everything else. Or they don't see how the focus on the family that they have and how they, they, they can only see their family messes up everything They don't see uh, how, how much study is a, is a part of things. And it can mess up anything out of balance can mess up anything else. And what happens is, is we think so highly of ourselves that we get out of balance and then we're not sober in the way we approach it. But the Bible says, think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. A, a little hint here. The, the hint from God is, remember we're not all at the same level. So somebody might do something that appears to be stupid to you. But truthfully, it might be an awesome blessing from God in their life. So leave them alone. 
You see, we need to start realizing that we're a part of a family. That's where my message was going today. If you look, present your body a living sacrifice. Be a part of the body. We're a family. This was supposed to be the day that we roll out all our stuff and we deal with all the things as far as our prayer chain and again the snowing and only half the croup here and no sense going through it twice and three times and four times in church time. But as you, you think about this, we're studying be a part of the body. How do you do that? Well, you start with, I beseech you, brethren, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God. Be what God asks you to be, which is not conform to the world, but transform. Renew your mind so that you can prove what's good and acceptable. Where are we proving this? Folks, I submit by looking at the rest of the chapter, particularly within the body. Would you agree with me that the struggle in Christian churches is not so much us with the outside world as it is within? Right here in the family. The way we win the battle is by not being transformed and acting the way the world would, but by being renewed. Not being conformed and acting the way the world. If I didn't say that right, conformed and acting the way the world did, but instead being transformed. Now listen, it, it says here at the end of verse 3, more highly than he ought according as he hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We all grow at different levels. Then verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, here is the proof of what I was trying to tell you that this chapter is about. As we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. How many of you have ever put those two verses with I beseech you, you present your body a living sacrifice? I know I haven't. But in the context of the scripture here, the presenting your body a living sacrifice unto God is to be brought into the family relationship of the church. Some of the hands, some of the eyes, some of the feet, some of the head, some of the the, the abdomen, some, some of the people who, who, who clean out all the gook, the appendix. We're all body parts. And that's what we ought to be. And every one of us is a part of the membership of the body of Christ. God wants us to have an attitude and an action and an understanding that says... I am not more highly needed, more highly skilled, more highly awesome than I ought to think. Instead, God wants me to be humbled, transformed, and proving as a good member of the body what is good, acceptable, and perfect. I'll tell you what, as I get older, I notice parts of my body that do not listen to me the way they used to. I notice parts of my body that yell at me when they never used to. I, I notice parts of my body that hurt and, and, and ache and are slow. I, I notice a lot of different things that have changed in my body. You know, when something isn't perfect, it doesn't feel very good. I... In college, I, I play a lot of sports. I did a lot of, of catching in in baseball, and so that's a lot of years of squatting on your knees. Not necessarily a good thing. A lot of years of squatting. Still love to squat and catch even now. Love to do it. But when I was at college, I was playing soccer. We are playing against a really good team. I kicked the ball, and the other team had a really good player that I kicked the ball away from. And when I kicked it away from him, he swung with all his might, and he kicked me in the bottom of my foot because the ball was already gone. 
And he did what they call hyperextended my knee, which means he bent it backwards because he kicked it so hard, my foot was on the way up, so he bent it backwards to where it went past the way the knee is supposed to bend. Every once in a while, like a couple weeks ago when my knee was hurting, for some reason it just acts up and that exact knee says to me, you did something that was not appropriate with me 20 some years ago and I just want to remind you. <laughs> okay? Listen, when a body part isn't functioning correctly, good and perfect, acceptable, it causes the rest of the body to ache, to become slower, to not be able to do the things it should, to not function the way it should, to not process the way it should, to not be what it should as a body. And what do we want our bodies to do? We want every part of it to fall in line and obey the body itself and do what it's supposed to do, right? So that when we're doing these things, it works and does it the way we want. Proving the acceptable perfect of God. Now, folks, my message today is that we need to see each other, everyone, as members of another. We were building to the point to where I had the rest of the verses here on share this, share that, share this, share that, and you can look at your bulletin and see what's coming next week. But my message is the idea that God wants us to be part of each other, sharing in the burdens, the joys, the ups, the downs, the struggles, sharing love when people make mistakes, when people are enemies, we give them food, we, we share constantly because our attitude is we're a part of the body and it's not about us. It's about God. I want to encourage you. Present your bodies a living sacrifice unto the Lord. But in the context of the scripture that we, we see here, that means fit into the body the way God has designed you to fit. And be what God has asked you to be. Be transformed, not conformed. Prove that he is an awesome God and he knows what he's doing. Be that type of family member. Have you ever had a family member in your family, maybe a cousin, maybe somebody related that really did not fit well? I'm not trying to be mean. Really did not fit well person who didn't conform or transform into being a part of the family. They cared more about themselves. It causes a lot of upheaval. Folks, I just want to encourage you. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. You'll see that eventually God's going to say, vengeance is mine. Let me have it. Somebody does something wrong. Praise the Lord. You know what you're doing. We are to share a lot of things. We'll preach about that next week. But God wants us to prove what is good and acceptable for Him. That's what God wants. So get off the high horse thinking we're doing stuff so almighty and instead beg him to tell us what needs to be done different and be renewed. And it will make us into a stronger family. By the way, I think this church is a great family atmosphere. I love it that you, you provide meals and you, you, you care about one another and you like to pray for one another and you like to ask how things are going. I, I love the way you react, but I think we could always evaluate ourselves and be even better. And we do so by renewing the mind. It's also why we redo a prayer chain and make it stronger. All these things 
are for that purpose. Now, hopefully, and I mean this, you don't feel like I've gypped you today. I've given you a message. It was my introduction. You'd had another 30 minutes or so. But I believe it's something that should touch our hearts and change us. I'd like to ask James if he would to uh, stand and pray. James, would you pray not only over our, our service here closing, but also over a special blessing, um, you and your family and your, your, your new loved one that's coming. Um, but would you please do that for us? Right. Heavenly Father, we do just come before you, Lord. We thank you, God, um, that you have made us just a holy community, Lord, that uh, we are gathered together as believers, Lord, and that uh, we are in this together. Lord. We, do, we do things together. Uh, we cry together. We laugh together. Uh, we play together. We pray together, Lord. And, and uh, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for each person here, what they bring to this uh, family, Lord, uh, that they uh, bring their gifts and talents, and, and uh, Lord, we, we thank you for each one uh, here today, Lord. Thank you for the time that we've had in fellowship, Lord, as you sang, and, and um, listened to the, the preaching of your word. I just pray that it would just bless our hearts, Lord. I pray the time that we have coming up, Lord, as we uh, share uh, in fellowship around the table, Lord, that it would be pleasing to you and honoring to your name. I'm be sweet, Lord. Um, just thank you, Lord. Thank you for the um, the reason that we can celebrate, Lord, this new life that's coming, Lord. And, uh, I pray that um, the baby Lord be healthy, Lord, and, and the baby would know that it's loved and, and cared for, Lord, and then this baby would um, grow up, Lord, uh, just to uh, to be a member of this family, Lord, that, that honors you and glorifies you. I pray now, even Lord. You would, God, even now, continue to uh, begin drawing this child uh, to you uh, for salvation. We'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, um, head downstairs. Uh, don't be afraid to wait on uh, some of the young fellows to come get you. Uh, Mike's been trying to clear it up out there and get it ready for you. I, I think it's kind of stopped uh, snowing for a little while, so we might be in good shape here for a few minutes. But let's not waste a lot of time getting down there, all right? By the way, baby dedication coming up on Mother's Day, just in case I forget to say something. Baby dedication coming up on Mother's Day. <laughs>